fix your hair. Sirens busy driving. Guess I'll make my move. Crazy. Today's guest has performed with jazz legend Miles Davis, Herbie Hancock, John McLaughlin, including rock star Mick Jagger. This is only the tip of the iceberg. Two of his albums, Soul Insider and Soul Grass, were nominated for Grammy Awards. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Bill Evans to the Voodoo Room. How's, how's the weather in Melbourne now? To be honest with you, it's pleasantly nice. It's going to be getting colder uh, blue soon, sc- right? Blue skies. It's blue skies. It's uh, uh, sunny 14. Oh, wow. Unusual because usually around this time of year, winter is this is where it breaks in around this time. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah, we're starting to warm up finally around here. This would be a nice weekend for the first time in a while. In New they, York. Yeah, but everybody has to stay away from each other. No one goes in any stores. I mean, it's like, you know, everybody takes hikes. And then if you're getting close to anybody on the trail, everybody splits off into the woods so they're not close to It's like a sci fi flick, man. I know, right? In I know. World, That's man. what I was saying. Have you ever read um, The Day of the Triffids? No. Man, you got to read that book. Really? It was written in the, uh, I think, 1930s. And uh, it really, it, you, you read the first, say, chapter and you go, wow, that's exactly what we're experiencing now. Really? Like you were saying, like a sci fi. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, that's trippy. All you can hear is the birds chirping and there's silence wow. outside of that. Wow. Well, at least now, I mean, the planet's starting to correct itself as far as pollution, at least at least for the time being. I'm sure it's going to all go back to the way it was. But people get a glimpse on what can happen if you actually do allow the planet to heal itself, which is so important, you know? That's absolutely. I mean, we, don't, we underestimate it. Yeah, totally. It's, it's crazy. But, uh, and, that, and that's a and people tend to think you're a bit heavy when you talk about that stuff, you know. But it's really important for not only our generation, but obviously future generations. And that's the that's the key to it, isn't it? To maintain humanity and make sure that it continues. Well, I, mean, I mean, there's only there's one small little green planet that we have, you know. I mean, it's like you don't take care of this, there's nothing left. You're not going to like take a step off to another little green planet. It's just dark space that at this point. That's all we know. So, yeah, I mean, it's sort of ridiculous to be so short-sighted as to, to like, you know, screw up the planet that you live on, the house that you live on. I mean, it's, it's idiocy. But, uh, hey, welcome to mankind. <laughs> that's it. We need uh, Roger Sequero to sort of come up with some answers. Exactly. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> anyway... So but, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to begin with um, you. You were going into the studio in January. Um, how's that coming along? Did you end up go- recording anything earlier this year? I did. Uh, I went in the studio with uh, Robin Ford, Keith Carlock, and Daryl Jones, and um, it's the second recording me and Robin have done together in the last year. Ah, it was amazing. I mean, you know, when you get guys like that. They have the sensibilities to be able to go in any direction. And so the music, you don't have to overwrite anything because it'll take its own personality, take on its own personality. And me and Robin have a good symbiotic relationship. You know, the music seems to work effortlessly. Recording goes really smoothly. And I like blues and jazz and soul, and and so does he. And then when you get a drummer like Keith Carlock, you know, he's been playing with Steely Dan for the last 20 some years, John Mayer, Sting, you know, and Daryl Jones with the Rolling Stones for that matter. But, um, you know, it just becomes a lot of fun in the studio and a very melodic uh, record, you know. We recorded it in Nashville, as a matter of fact. And um, yeah, it's not out yet. Um, it's not going to be out probably for another year. I think they're going to wait until this whole COVID 19 thing is over. Since it seems like everything musically has been frozen for a year, you know. Um, but um, but last year, uh, me and Robin did another one with Keith Carlock and James Genus on bass. And uh, Robin sang a tune, I sang a tune. The uh, record did really well. And um, yeah, you know, you just try to keep it fresh. I like to do different kinds of music, you know. I mean, 
basically Robin can play any kind of music, but he he loves to play blues and he's known for blues and he's got a great voice. And so uh, you know, we get in the studio and it's kind of a jazz meets whatever. But it always has a groove. You know, we like to play with grooves and uh and if you get the best guys that can do it, now you can't go wrong. <laughs> you know. Mm. No, that's right. Because you did play with um Daryl back in the mid eighties with Miles Davis. On, on that's right. I played a I played in a on decoy and decoy. Yeah, I other, played on right? a lot of different projects yeah. and groups with Daryl. Um we played together with uh Andy Summers, we played together with Herbie Hancock, uh a short lived band called ESP. Um we've and we played with Miles together. So yeah, we have quite a history and he's done different records of mine and yeah, he's a great player, a great person, and uh, so that that's always fun when we can get him. I mean, he's a busy guy, you know, and, and when he goes out with the Rolling Stones, he's out with the Rolling Stones, you know. Sometimes they go out for a while, and uh, so. so. So when he played with you on the um, Miles Davis album, Decoy, was he wasn't in the Rolling Stones at that no, point? He, um, I think he was just going Well, actually, right after Miles, he joined um, Sting. That that band with uh, Branford Marcellus, Omar Hakim, you know, Bring on the Night stuff. It was some great records, and then he then he did a tour actually with Madonna. And he's played with everybody. It's like he's uh, he's had a lot of really cool gigs. He plays great. He's a great guy, and uh, you know, at this point in time for me, I've been doing this a long time. Uh, you just you've sort of created a lot of relationships with a lot of different musicians that have become friends. You go on the road, it becomes a family. And then now, uh, you know, I just want to play music with that I want to play, that I'm inspired to play with. Musicians that I know and have fun with, you know? I mean, you got to keep it simple. I just wanted to just go back to the early years. Um, when you, because tra- you came from Illinois originally, right? And then you, you went to university and then you transferred to New York. That period of time... What was your processes in terms of um, preparing yourself to get to the next stage, you know, like playing with someone like Miles Davis? Well, you know, it's a it's a steady sort of ongoing process that starts started for me when I was like, uh, when I played saxophone at 11, you know. Uh, you're always trying to play as well as you can. You become saturated in the music, into learning how to play jazz, and you're just... You know, I was just thoroughly interested in it, you know, and my my parents, um, they promoted it as well and and backed me up uh, on what I like to do musically and stuff, taking me to music lessons and things like that. So it's like to prepare yourself is just learn how to play, learn jazz, learn harmony, learn the saxophone, learn the important things that allow you to become a good jazz musician so that... When the opportunity arises, um, you're ready for it because you never know if you're going to get the opportunity uh, to play with somebody legendary or great or whatever. But if the opportunity comes up, you want to be ready. You don't want to not have your your stuff together. You know what I mean? Whether it's saxophone, trumpet, whatever instrument it is, you know. And I think most musicians sort of say the same kind of thing. You know what I mean? Yes, indeed. Mm-hmm. Because I read that you practice a lot in lofts. What does that mean exactly in New York? What what does playing in lofts mean? Well, a loft is just a big space. And uh, back in the early 80s, it was a po- – and late 70s, but I was in college then. Um, it's just big spaces, you know, commercial spaces in New York City. And because they're commercial at night, most of the time, there's nobody in the space above you and nobody in the space below you. So you could just play music all the time. Get a set of drums. Musicians would come over. I had two different lofts, uh, several different years apart, and uh, you just you'd play. You'd play all the time. The whole thing, the whole reason for it was to play music. So you'd play music during the day. You'd go to clubs at night. It was a great scene. I mean, nowadays it's amazingly expensive to uh, to live in Manhattan. I mean, as a young musician, it's almost impossible. I mean, it's outpriced. People trying to, especially young musicians. Um, but for the time when I was coming up, it was a great thing, you know. It was a great place to be. 
And was that something like um, Warhol's Factory? Was that was it something similar to to that, but for musicians? These yeah, sort of probably. Lives? I mean, um, a lot of great jazz musicians used to come over. I mean, Wynton Marcellus, when he was eighteen years old, came over to play when he was going to Juilliard, and you know, I mean, uh, Steve Grossman, Dave Liebman. I mean, all the saxophone players I liked, and great drummers, and. Uh, you know, we were playing a lot of bebop music, a lot of standards, just really trying to just get down to playing and going to hear players. I mean, saxophone-wise, I mean, I could go hear all the great saxophone players by just walking out the door and going down into the village of New York. Ten minutes away, I could, there might be five different clubs going on. Joe Henderson in one, Dexter Gordon in another, the Brecker Brothers in another, uh, Sonny Rollins in another. I mean, I remember some nights I've, I saw all the legends of jazz almost in one night walking from block to block. I don't think you can really do that now, but for me then it was amazing. I got to tell you, you know? So, so in New York at around that time, what did you see and what did you think it offered you when you first arrived there? You know, I mean, I know, I know you've, you've touched on it when you spoke about the jazz and that obviously is the reason you went to New York, but Mm-hmm. What did it actually offer you, you know, outside of that? Uh, a chance to to hear great players. I mean, I'm I, I'm very visual as well. So just to get up as close as I can to a stage and and hear great saxophonists play. And they, they're three feet away from me. I could see the way they stand, how they play, how they think. And that affected me. And I just wanted to I, I just wanted to be around great players all the time and hear how it's done correctly all the time. And yeah, and that was what I did. So it sort of it, it brings the standard and the bar way high, and I'd be totally inspired, you know. So by the time I got the gig with Miles, I was still living. I just moved to the city, basically at that time. Uh, I could go hear music, play in the loft, and then I'm also sort of hanging out with Miles Davis during the day. It's crazy. <laughs> what was that like, hanging out with Miles Davis? Well, uh, segueing. Uh, <laughs> well, it's it's it, it's amazing. I'd go there every day. It's like my new pal was Miles Davis. You know, uh, he sort of respected the way I played. I I sort of auditioned for him when he called me. Bring up your horn and play a blues for me. You know, and that's and speaking of what we were talking about before, being ready. I thought it all comes down to this. You know, I grabbed my horn and I went up to him, and he stood next to me in his building, and his he owned this building on the ground floor, and. 77th Street in Manhattan. And um, he said, play, play me a blues. You know, Bobby Irving, who's eventually ended up playing keyboards with him, was there with, with Vince's nephew. And I played for a while and he said, hey, if I played saxophone, I'd like to play just like you. You sound great. Let's go get something to eat. So I assumed I'm in for whatever that is. And then we started going in the studio and then I was a saxophone player for a number of years, you know. But it was amazing, you know, getting to see, getting to getting into his mind uh, was. Uh, I'm planning on writing a book and actually talking a, a couple chapters about about that as well. It's very interesting observing that and being around that, of how our very creative mind like that, how it operates, how he, how I perceive the way he thought uh, about music and musicians and life, and it was really interesting because I'm this Midwestern white guy, uh, you know. I don't do drugs. Um, I just want to play my instrument and, you know, straight ahead guy. And here's Miles coming from where he's coming from. And the, but the two worked. Our personalities worked very well together. He trusted my judgment. And um, I actually helped him put the band together. So, yeah, it was, um, it was really cool. I'm like 21, 22 years old, you know, hanging out with Miles Davis every day and playing music with him. It was it was amazing. What can I say? Where, you can't get a better start. I'll tell you that much. No, <laughs> pressure's on. I mean, what was the what was the first what was the first album you worked on with Miles? Uh, it's called Man with the Horn. That was his comeback. And that was what, nineteen seventy nine? No, it was nineteen eighty. Uh, we were working on it in fall of nineteen eighty, and it came out in eighty one. And between eighty one, eighty two, eighty three, going into eighty four, we recorded uh, a bunch of records. Actually, Star People, We Want Miles. Uh, uh, Man with the Horn. Um, there's a couple other ones. And a few other records came out that were live recordings that we did back then. Uh, several that came out in the last 
15, 20 years, I guess. They keep coming up with them. They recorded everything. But um, yeah, you know, and that gig gave me the opportunity to to believe in what I do and play with other people. You know what I mean? So when I finally, when I joined John McLaughlin's group, I had some confidence, you know? And, um, and then you get to sort of like parlay that into getting the opportunity to play with, you know, a lot of the musicians that were your idols, you know? Um, so great period of time, you know, I must say. Because yeah. that all came to a, well, not a halt, but you transformed, in, nine, in the early 90s, you'd started doing your own music uh, with Soulgrass. Is that right? And uh, No, actually, starting in 1990, I, I did a couple tours on my own, um, touring like in Europe, doing long tours in Europe starting like 1990. And then during the night, during the, 92, I did a record called, well, I did one called Petite Blonde with Dennis Chambers, Victor Bailey, Chuck Loeb, and Mitch Foreman. And then, um, that was really fun. And then I did a record called Push, which was sort of hip-hop jazz. I used some some rappers and really cool record, one of my favorites. And then that followed up with Live in Europe, um, a, some a record called Acoustic Groove, uh, Starfish in the Moon. That was one of my favorites as well. Touch. And I did a number of different records that sort of like the first couple, first two or three were sort of in the hip hop jazz soul groove where I was sort of pushing the envelope in that music, touring with it constantly. And then um, it actually, I did, I did Big Fun, Soul, uh, soul Inside. I did a bunch of records. <laughs> and then um, Soulgrass started in 2004 where I, I used Americana musicians. Bela Fleck, Victor Wooten, Vinnie Culliuda, um, Stuart Duncan, a lot of the Nashville musicians. See, I have a short attention span. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I, I, what can I say? So I, I, I like to do different kinds of music. Miles sort of uh, inspired me to like, if you feel like doing a different kind of music and you hear it, do it. Do what you, you feel. Do it, yeah. Go with your instincts. And so that's when all that curse began. <laughs> but um, yeah, I did a bunch of records under the Soulgrass thing. I just, I sort of, Ended that a few years ago, but I don't say ended because everything sort of one thing flows into the next. You know, it's it's all just a growth pattern of of what you're inspired to do, um, which is cool in music because it keeps you young, it keeps you on the edge. You know, it keeps you practicing, it keeps you writing. Uh, it's really cool. You know, I mean, I feel fortunate to be able to do that. The only unfortunate thing about being a musician is during this COVID-19 thing, your whole entire year comes to a halt because what we do is live music. That's what I do. So that's not going to happen. But we're really lucky to be able to be musicians because there's so many people that are suffering that, you know, I'm about the last person that's going to complain. You know what I mean? Do you do more festival work or do you do more like Blue Notes, Birds, that sort of style of uh, hotel work? Yeah, it all depends on the time of year. In the summer, it's mostly festivals. Spring, we might do a tour that'll be festivals and clubs. Um, when I go to Asia, a lot of concerts. I'll go to Japan. It'll be the Blue Notes, and that's a club. Uh, so it all depends on where you're going. When we go to Spain, it's concerts. Everywhere is, you know, is different, really, depending on the situation. You know, there's some really great clubs out in the world, and in different countries, and there's some really great festivals outside that are just amazing. It's really, uh, me and Robin Ford, we're going to tour this summer and do all the festivals in Europe, but we're going to change that and just shift it right over to 2021, take the whole tour. And uh, and I do a band called The Spy Killers, which is the band we did at Birds. We ended up calling The Spy Killers, which was me, Wolfgang Hoffner, Simon Oslender, and Gary Granger. And you were the engineer on that. And I was so I'm so proud of that CD because... That live CD, we sold everywhere, and we still do. And we got your name on there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did a great job. You made that happen, man. I got to thank you again for that. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that it. That was awesome, man. You did a great job recording that. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Bill. Sure, man. Thank you. Why did you choose the saxophone? I'm going to just go back a little bit. Um, what, why did you choose? Well, I was a piano player originally when I was like five, to, five years old to about 10, 11 years old. And then um, I went to hear, my mother took me to hear the high school jazz band. We we're sitting up in the balcony and I wanted to hear the piano player play with the, the big band because I thought that's what I'm going to do. And then an alto sax player got up and played a solo and um, the spotlight went on him and he stood in front of the band and it was amazing. And I looked at my mother and I said, 
That's what I want to do. And she says, but you're a piano player. I said, I'll always play piano. I said, but that was too cool. I said, that's what I want to do. That was like so cool. And um, so that's how it started, really. And then I, I got a tenor saxophone and I started playing it from that point on. Mm-hmm. Crazy, right? And uh, what's it like currently in New York? Have you have, Obviously, you've been out and about. Uh, what's the vibe out in the street there? You mean... Um, I mean, before the COVID nineteen, no, just, just leading or up to now, the COVID nineteen, and and now, have you? What's the comparison? Well, I mean, they still have some some great jazz clubs. There's a club called Iridium that uh, I play once a year at least. Me and Steve Lukather of Toto have a band together with Will Lee, Keith Carlock, Steve Weingart, and um, we play once a year there. Me and Mike Stern have a band together. We play Birdland. Um, sometimes I play the Blue Note with my band. Um, so there's three or four clubs, but it sort of narrows it down. Um, it's still a cool vibe, uh, but, you know, I look at it from as an out-of-towner now. I mean, I live an hour north of Manhattan, but I um, I stay in the city when I play there, and I come back home after the week is over. So I look at it like any major city. But there's a lot of great young players coming up, you know? I mean, there really is. And it's the difficult thing is it's where are they going to play. So in the future, I actually want to have another band together where I use musicians up and coming that are in their twenties um, that can really play that need a place to play. And maybe I can give them a stage, you know, where they can do a tour with me and people get a chance to hear them. That's an idea of mine that I want to do before I get too old. <laughs> that's all about mentoring. Yeah. I mean, that's what, that's what I did when I was young. And um, if I could do that and help out some young players, it'd be great. And, um, and they're a little less expensive too. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, but I really want to do that because I like young people. I like they're such great young players and there's just not enough places for them to play because most of the festivals and everywhere, they want all-star bands. Well, how do you become a name if you don't get a chance to play? So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, it's sort of tough. So if I can help anybody, uh, I'll do that, you know? So what, what was the transformation? When did you see that transformation of, um, New York being a very, uh, uh, commercial rich for clubs and there was places to play then to not many and then to this situation we're currently under so what, what when did that all take place do you think that shift well it, it, it's been slowly happening even starting in the late 80s going into the 90s rents started getting you know men, real estate in new york is always expensive but then it started to just shoot up and not, and it didn't stop and then 9 11 happened and then it went down again because people were leaving the city and then it just shot up again in the last 20 years. It has gone so high that I don't, I'm amazed that people actually can afford to live in that town or even want to. But it's a great city. It's just, you know, it's unless you have a lot of money, it's not a very conducive place to have fun. Um, so I like to go into the city, have dinner, and then leave or just spend a day there. It's still a great vibe. It's got a great, it's like a, uh, you can feel a pulse. New York has a pulse, you know, but uh, man, I like Melbourne, man. I had a great time. The couple times I went there, that's a great vibe. Getting to know that town too, man. That was really awesome, man. You're just pretty far. <laughs> yeah, I know we're in the ass end of the world. I know, but it's it's uh, it's happening, man. It's it's such great outdoor things to do too, which I love. I got to come back there and spend some time and see the rest of the country. It's so huge. Oh, it's massive. Yeah, massive, and it's very different. The south to the north, you know, just like America is, I guess, you know. There's similarities, but there's the very there's vast differences as well. Oh, here it's ridiculous. I mean, and and now it's it's unfortunate because it's so polarized, you know, politically, and uh, and that's kind of sad. I mean, it's I've never been into politics pretty much ever. I, I stick to music, but it's it's really a drag to see all this polarization going on and 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 all this um, idiocy from the top down, you know. Just, uh, it's just, it's really ridiculous. I can't wait till the whole, th the whole spin is over and, uh, and it takes on a more normal, straightforward, innovative approach to, uh, to everything because it's ridiculous right now. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think partly, um, like you were talking about what happened to New York post, um, uh, 9-11, people were leaving, up until that point, you'd have to say, I mean, I know in Melbourne, definitely, um, the uh, 
in the suburbs where we used to have vibrant um, communities of musicians and playing at certain clubs and pubs, they all shut down. I think it was very similar to what was happening in New York. Rents became too expensive um, and they become gentrified. The weird thing that I could never understand is the people who move into these areas move into those areas because there is that vibe and then they push that vibe out. I, I could never understand. Is that the sort of situation that happened in New York? Like people go there for that experience but then they drive the people who are giving them that experience out. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, well, you know, it's all based on economics, you know. I mean, everything is based on economics and money and, and finances and that's pretty much, you know, you have that small little island of Manhattan with so much going on and, and, it, and they just, they can just keep raising the prices through the roof and people will continue to pay them. It sort of does take the soul out of the city. It, you know, through the decades it's changed. I think it had a little more soul at other times, but um, it still, it still is a great place to visit and a great place to spend a little time. You know, I still love playing there. I mean, to go in there and play some great players and, and spend a week in the city, almost like a uh, tourist is fun, you know, go to Central Park during the day, have some great restaurants at night and play some music. I mean, it's a great time. It really is. So yeah. what's that? There's a place that Mike Stern plays at a lot. Have you played at that particular place that Mike plays at? In oh, you're York? talking about like the 55 bar? Sorry, what? He plays a little tiny bar in the village a lot of times. Yeah, I think that's the one. And have you played it, with him there? No? Never played there. No, I'm not that interested in going down there. I've been offered that a few hundred times, but... Nah, you know, it's a it's a tiny little place and I've got close, but you know, for me I'd have to drive. It would take me a couple hours to get there and then you try to find a space for your car down in the village is impossible. And you know, I think if I was living in the city I'd have probably been there a lot. Just just keep your chops, you know, play j just for the fun of playing, but uh no, nah, I never really and I think after a while, Mike and the rest of the guys asking me to do it and me turning them down, they finally gave up and said, no, nah, I don't think Bill's going to end up doing this. He hasn't done it in the last 20 years. I don't think he's going to do it now. <laughs> you never know, but I don't, I'm, not, I'm not looking forward to that. But I mean, you know, there's always a few clubs that I do play that I was mentioning before. You know, those are fun and I can spend a week in the city and play. I treat New York like any other city in the world, you know. I don't overplay it and I don't underplay it, you know. Jazz and the the language of jazz is like coming from for me bebop music, and if you listen to the language of bluegrass, the notes it's very similar. The improvisation is very similar, just different choice of notes. So I started to hear the similarities between the two kinds of music. I'm not an authority on who does the kind of music in bluegrass, and and uh, I learned some of the tunes, but I mean for me, I just use those instruments with um, the way I play jazz and write jazz. And I put those together, and it was very interesting and very fresh-sounding. So I used banjo and violin and dobro and mandolin sometimes. And we'd bring this, we'd create this real percussive, rhythmic sort of melodic music that was different and pleasing to the ear. You know, I mean, it was like very challenging. I mean, some of the bluegrass melodies that, uh, that I would sort of play were super fast i mean it was like lightning fast and so some of the stuff in jazz is too but i'd write some music very similar to that and um it was really fresh sounding man a lot of fun i want to do it again i mean i'm actually planning on moving to nashville hopefully in the next year because there's so many musicians there and weather's a little better um but uh you know a change isn't bad but um yeah i mean so it's you know how did you um come about playing with willie nelson Willie Nelson's manager was Miles Davis's manager way back in 1981. And I met Willie back then. And years later, um, he asked me if I wanted to sit in with his band, which is not far from my house. Uh, I would say this is probably 22, 23 years ago. And I sat in with him at Keith Richards was actually there. We sat in together and played the concert. And Willie said, anytime you want to sit in, just pop in. And I got to know the guys in his band. And he, he plays his version of jazz, as, you know, standards like Blue Sky and, you know, really, really cool ballads. And so it, it ended up that way. If I was free and Willie was around playing, I'd just show up and play part of his set. So I ended up playing with him dozens of times. You know, it was fun. I'd just pop on, say hi. It was like a family thing, you know, almost. So it's something different. And I, you know, I, I like the inspiration of playing with different people, different kinds of music. And in jazz, you know, we're fortunate that we can sort of, 
you know, we're like chameleons. We could sort of like melt into any stage and make it work, you know, because jazz is not an easy music. But if you can learn how to play, you can pretty much kind of play any kind of music or at least fake it. <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, I, I, yeah, I've been on a lot of different stages, you know, rock music, jazz, whatever. Yeah, I noticed <laughs> going through your biography, I'm going, this is, this is not, it, it, I mean, the transformation that you've gone from Miles Davis, I mean, that was pretty much straight out of university, wasn't it? You, yeah. you, you were sort of, that was your aim. You wanted to be a jazz player. Yeah. Was that, would that be correct? Yep. Yeah. And, um, and then you've ended up working with Mick Jagger. I mean, you know, how did, how did you end up working with Mick Jagger? I mean, that's a very different type of music again. You've gone from, you know, improvised jazz almost to rock, you know, rock music. Well, the key thing about, to keep in mind in that is it's still the saxophone. Same saxophone, same guy. Just the music changes, you know. So Mick used to come and hear, hear us with Miles, and um, I met him back then. And so when I got the call to do his solo record, Primitive Cool, which was in like 1990, I think, or 91, I was living in the city. And I'd just go to the studio with him for a few weeks every day. And it was fun getting to know him. He's a great guy. He's a great musician. Really talented writer. I mean, I was like, wow, I get it, you know. Because coming from jazz, we're like, well, you know, it's, music is simpler. You know, we'll see what it's about. Hats off, man. I had total respect for this guy when I left there. I said, man, this guy is bad. <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, you know, from the thing is, when I had the chance to play with Miles and everybody was checking out that band when I was a kid. I, I said I was a kid. So from there, it sort of like parlayed into a lot of different opportunities. You know, that's what was I was very fortunate of, you know. I remember I sat down with you after one of your shows at Birds and we were sitting upstairs and I, and this has stuck with me ever since really when you mentioned you said I remember going to the Grammys with Miles Davis and the impression that that left with you can you explain what was leading up to that and why you were there Yeah well they were doing um we were playing a song you know I I'm pretty sure yeah we played a song in the Grammys and um you could just see on people's faces you look out and you'd see Diana Ross and, you know, you'd see all these superstars in rock music and they were all in awe of Miles Davis. And you could see it on their faces. And um, you realized how much respect that everyone had for Miles. And even backstage, before we even went on, I was sitting in the green room and Stevie Wonder was saying, can anybody introduce me to Miles Davis? You know, and all these guys were there and uh, famous musicians and stuff. And I remember... In 1992, uh, I was in Los Angeles. I happened to be just hanging out there for a couple of days. I can't remember exactly what. Uh, I think I was playing on the Andy Summers record. And and I was getting together with friends, you know, like Lee Rittenhour's a buddy, and I was playing with him some. And, and then um, I got a call from Don Henley to do the Grammys with him with the song End of the Innocence, which was a big hit with uh, Bruce Hornsby. So the song came on, it's on YouTube, you can see it now, and I walked on taking an entrance to play the solo on there that Wayne Shorter had done on the record. And in the third row, Miles was in attendance, and I could see him smiling as I come on stage, and, I could, and Michael Jackson is sitting in front of him, and it was really kind of cool, because Miles is kind of smiling like, oh yeah, that's, that's, my, that's my saxophone player, yeah, that's, you know, that's my kid, you know what I mean? It was kind of like... He's kind of going like this, you know. <laughs> he didn't know I was there. And, uh, yeah, it's just really cool. I got a lot of memories like that, you know. Oh, that's terrific. So you are also a painter because you gave me a print, which I still have on my wall, and I still get a lot of people commenting, who, who is that? And I said, oh, that's just some guy that gave me a Yeah, I paint. You're, a matter of fact, I'm, I'm, <laughs> call, I, I'm talking from my, my – uh, music slash painting studio if you can see in the back i paint right over there and uh, i, I did, we're, we're in the process of showing the house to sell it so all that would everything in back of me would have been all paint would have been all pictures and paints and everything else but yeah i'm in a cool room right now that's um i had this building built with three car garage below me and a really cool room here with skylights and windows facing the woods and i like to paint it's a great outlet for me and um yeah, I mean, it's just, I do like a lot of abstract stuff and uh, boats, mountain scenes. I don't know. I just mess around. I'm a beginner, but uh, I have fun doing what I do. When, when did you take up painting? About 10 years ago, maybe. 
my mother's actually a well-known artist and she helps me. She gives me tips and, I, and I've, she's 90 now and she's looking great, doing great, still painting all the time. I mostly do watercolors. Um, I took a course with her in Florida last January before all the COVID stuff started happening. Uh, you know, I'm like the definitive student, you know, I mean, I'm trying to play my horn better. I'm trying to, I'm, I've been singing more. Um, you know, I'm trying to paint, uh, play piano. I mean, it's, it just keeps me busy and keeps me occupied. And I like, I like learning every, whatever I'm doing. I like learning. I'm taking Spanish now too. <laughs> I'm learning Spanish. Come well, that, that'll, uh, that'll help you with, uh, onset of dementia. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, well, no, every night. Learning I, another language. Is learning that, is another that really language true? apparently does. Yeah. Good. You can speak multiple languages that will really help you with, uh, combating the onset of dementia oh that's a good thing to know because i forget everything anyway i know right yeah where was i at what were we talking about yeah that's <laughs> right <laughs> I, I get most people aren't you paying attention i am i'm just uh, i've got a short attention span and uh, i'm trying to you know comprehend everything that's being said exactly but but um well, you know, it's been a it's been a ride. You know, I mean, uh, you've played with all these people. I had to research you when I was mixing you for the first time, and I and I actually thought you were coming out with um, can't remember the guy's name. He, Josh he Dion, bluegrass, and he was a drummer who sang the song. That's and, Josh Dion, yeah, and, yeah. And I thought he was terrific. He is. He's fantastic. He's doing his own band now, and we still keep in touch. Um, all the time we text each other we don't say anything that makes any sense it's sort of been a running joke between us for like the last few years where you know it might he might say something like uh the trees on the side of the mountain look beautiful in the morning that'll be his text and i'll say something like if you eat too many pancakes you'll end up taking a nap you know something like that and that'll be that'll be our correspondence we'll do stuff like that that'll happen forever no but in my um soul my last soul grass band um that I had uh, Josh Dion sang, and we did a record called Dragonfly that he sang on, and also live in uh, Moscow, he sang on that. Phenomenal talent, phenomenal drummer, and a phenomenal singer. And uh, yeah, we'll do stuff again, I'm sure. How, how did you get to Russia? That's an, a really unusual place for... Uh, we flew there. We flew there in a commercial jet. <laughs> but did you have a did you have a promoter in Russia or? Uh, it, it was a cultural thing. It's where they, um, it's sort of their government contacts ours, and they it's sort of like a, you know, uh, good, uh, you know, a, a peaceful sort of commingling between the cultures. In my band, we play jazz and we play Americana and we play funk and everything, and and so we toured all over Russia. I've done two, three different tours, and. Um, it's really great because it's, it's an amazing country. It's a huge country. And the people there are super friendly and super nice. I mean, what you see as far as how it's being run, that's completely different than the people that are living there. The people living there are just smiling, hardworking, good-natured, warm people. And, um, uh, yeah, I, it's a really great experience. I mean, I'm really happy to have had the opportunity to have gone there when I did. And we recorded the record live in Moscow there because... Uh, it was almost the same thing as Bird's Basement. We were just recording, and um, we had such a good night. And uh, we we decided we're going to put this thing out. It's 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 not right to just not just to keep this, you know, Locked on a away. disc and not put it out for people to listen to. So we had, that's why we're live in Moscow, and everything is live, no overdubs. And Josh sang his butt off on that thing. Oh my god, it was pretty amazing. And part of that concert was recorded in front of Putin and all his guys. You could see them in the audience. <laughs> you know, I thought, isn't this funny? Look, look, another round of vodka for these boys. Yeah, right. Oh, they drink vodka there. Let me tell you, they can put it away. Yeah, a couple of guys in the band decided one night, not me. They decided they're going to try to like have some vodka with some of the local guys. <laughs> they they were hurting the next day. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> these guys can drink. Woof. Oh yeah. I mean, they, they as soon as they get get it fed through the bottle when they're a child, you know, in Russia. Matter of fact, the one night we had a night off in Kursk, and uh, a few of the local promoters and and their friends said, "Oh, we're all going to meet down in the bar." We're gonna, and a guy came in and it looked like he had a fifteen gallon jug. The whole thing was vodka, and he was holding it over his shoulder. 
And between, I think, about nine guys, they drank the entire thing. Unbelievable. Sure. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Pretty deep. I, I, I grew up with some um, Eastern European uh, families, and their fathers had really a lot of drinking problems um, yeah. to the point where they would just binge drink. And you'd see them, as a, you know, as a 10-year-old kid, you'd be walking down the street and you'd see your mate's dad lying in the gutter, you know. Jesus. And, uh, with a suit on and just, you know, uh, dribbling from the mouth and going, hey, come here, boy, and here's some money. And uh, you think he's great because he's giving you a couple of dollars, you know, but uh, right. then you realise he has a problem. But, I mean, he would he could drink for a month and then he just doesn't drink for another month and then he drinks for – that's how he lived his life. It was sort of weird. That's sort of weird, yeah. Yeah. That's a trip. That's, and that's dangerous. And and that's where I got the Russian – I knew that the those Eastern Bloc – countries you know they they're hardened to it you know i mean for me i i look at a, a bottle i'll look at a glass of vodka and i'll uh, collapse you know <laughs> yeah it's they're conditioned i'd say they're conditioned especially when it goes to 50 50 degrees below zero that's pretty rough it's pretty rough but they deal with it man they're hardy people great people were you there during the winter one time i was and i remember getting off a plane in siberia and I had a big coat on. I got off that plane, and it was the coldest thing I've ever felt in my life. And I got in to the, um, to the terminal, and the, the people that were picking us up, I said, I can't believe how cold it is. It's freezing. And they said, it is not cold. It is only cold if you don't have enough clothes on. If you have, and they were like, they had these huge jackets on. And I had a pretty big jacket, but it was it was at least 30 or 40 below zero. And they said, you should be here when it's really cold. And I said, what's really cold? 100 below zero. I said, I don't think I should be here when it's that. It was something else, man. But, you know, yeah, they said, and, and you, you know, you go in your hotel and the water's running in the sinks. And they said, don't turn it off ever. Because if you do, it'll freeze in two minutes, and they'll ne and it'll break the pipes. Unbelievable! Yeah, it's a different thing. It's a different thing. I can't even comprehend that. So, so the while you're asleep, you still have to keep the water running. Twenty just dripping. Hours, yeah, you have to have a little week. bit of a drip coming down in the, some of the places we we're at. Yeah, because if you didn't, then um, the pipes would freeze. I mean, literally freeze. One of the one of the concert halls, there was a sink that was kind of running in the dressing room, and I just by habit. You know, uh, I washed my hands and I shut it off. And this Russian woman came charging in the room and turned it on, and she's just screaming at me in Russian. And, I, and she left. And the guy was standing. I said, "What did I do?" He said, "She said, where are you from? You never turn off the water in the winter time. Where? What are you crazy?" I'm like, oh, "Wow, okay, got it. <laughs> it's a trip, huh?" Ah, uh, yeah, totally. I mean. I, I, can't, I can't, like I said, I can't comprehend it because I've never, I'll never go to a cold country because uh, my background is from uh, Malta and Malta is a small island in the Mediterranean. Oh, I've played in Malta many times. Have you? Beautiful country, yeah. I love Malta. Oh, oh, there you go. Yeah, there's a harbor down in there. We'd play right in the harbor and uh, and we'd stay at um, uh, the Continental or something um, right up right up on the hill. And then we'd usually have a couple of days off. So we'd like go across the island and and go swimming in another part of the island or wherever. Yeah, it's beautiful. Beautiful. Man, so you you actually you played in Valletta. Yeah. Mhm. Mm there's wow. a, there's a really there's a really great jazz festival there. I've played it probably four times. Was that with your own band yeah. or was that with No, every time it was with my own band. Oh, wow, that's great. What was your times when you got went on stage? Were you in the evening or were you during the yeah, day? Yeah, it's like right when it's starting to get dark. You know, like the festival would start at like 7.30 and then it's starting to get dark. By the time you finish, the lights are on the stage, you know. But there'd be 1,500, 2,000 people in front of you, you know. And it's beautiful because you'd look out and you could see the harbor with the boats and everything. It was great. Really beautiful. Yeah, that's a great place to go. Yeah, man. Now you would have tasted some of the... Traditional uh, Pat Sisters, did you try some of them? Yes. Oh yeah, man. You know they take us out and we'll get. <laughs> and, you know all the local places want you to try the local food. You know, so when we're there, you know they 
they said, well, you have to try this, you have to try this, you know. And that's one of the benefits of, of touring because, you know, go to some places in Italy and they give, they, you get to, to eat the local food, which is always great. And then you go to Spain and you'll have some amazing fish and tapas. And then, you know, you go to London and it's not really that good, so you get the Indian food. <laughs> but no, but um, yeah, it's a really cool thing to be able to do that. It's like a uh, adrenaline rush when you go on the road. Adrenaline for your senses, you know, it's fun. What, um, what's your perception of Malta? Since you've uh, it's like a desert times. sort of oasis to me, you know, very friendly people. Everything's made out of rock and stone. It's like it's never going to fall down and um, really clear water. Beautiful. It's a beautiful place to, uh, to go and visit for sure. I was never there for more than three or four days, but uh, did you grow up there? Yeah, I lived in Mal- I lived in Sicily and Malta um, oh, when okay. I was a child through up until I was about four or five years of age, and then I and basically we were on a, an Italian cruise ship that we that I lived on for a number of years. And the Achille Laura, I don't know if you remember the Achille Laura. Of course, Laura, the Achille was, Laura. Uh, what happened down there? That's a famous ship. What happened on that? Yeah, um, I think in the mid eighties there was a Palestinian. That was the uh, ship. That's yeah, right. Yeah, something the happened. Lord. I don't know. Some terrorist attack happened on it, or something. That's like right. That. And then it, it did. sunk somewhere in the uh, Bay of uh, Naples, or something. I don't know exactly. It was something like that. And that's what you lived on for a while, huh? I, I lived on that boat for a number of years. Yeah, wow. as a child. Wow. Yeah. Going to school on that boat? Uh, no, I was only from the. I was on there from when I was up from I was on there from two years of age up until I was about five something like that so I was just I couldn't speak a word of English when I came to Australia oh no kidding wow and we were going to stay in Europe because my parents had 10 children and I was the youngest and so we were going to leave the eight kids back in Melbourne and stay in Europe Mm -hmm. but uh, they you know a job fell through because if my father had got Given the job in Malta, he would have stayed in Malta, but they fell through, so he had to come back to Australia. Oh, I see. Wow. So that's why that's why I'm here, Bill. And the and and the fires did they just just tear apart half the country? Yeah, the uh, fires uh, ravaged. Um, it was just unprecedented, like the COVID nineteen, unprecedented. You know. Uh, I can't even comprehend. I, I mean, I drove through just some of the smog uh, going on summer holidays uh, to the uh, to, to Port Ferry, which is the going west. And uh, as I, it took about three hours or two and a half hours to get out of the fog, the smoke. Wow! Out of Melbourne, and then you just saw blue skies. But up until that point, it was so you look. You, get, you you go through the dark clouds or the smoke. Mm-hmm. You, you come out of it and you look back and you just see a haze of smoke that's lingering from the fires. It was just something I've never experienced. But I, I didn't think it was going to end, to be honest with you, you know. Did it wipe out a bunch of species? Oh, yeah. Heaps of animals died. Um, oh, vegetation uh, had um, dissipated. Um, yeah, it was uh, like just seeing the koalas. You would have seen photos, I'm sure, from uh, wow. news reports. Yeah. The koalas were just decimated, you yeah, know. And I, my heart just, I mean, just yeah, seeing koalas, even right. dead dogs, you know, um, trying to escape farming, uh, fencing and being stuck to the fence and being burnt to a cinder. It was just unbelievable, you know, kangaroos, uh, wallabies. Jesus. And then and then we came uh, out of that and, uh, you know, Jesus a month later Christ. we're in uh, COVID-19. So it, it, this year, I mean, that whole period was just like, in reflection with a clear mind, it was just so full on. And then we were dealing with what we were dealing with personally in terms of, uh, you know, with the club and everything else that was happening on the side of that. So it's been a pretty intense f- five months. Sure. Wow. Yeah. Sometimes it just all comes on at, at the same time and just piles on. And you just got to kind of like relax and just let it all happen and then Come yeah, out on the absolutely. other side and stay as positive as you I can. I have a you know? philosophy. I don't know if it's working, but this is what a mantra. I saw a little sign, a Zen sign, which said, live in the moment, and that's all you need to do. 
So there's no past, there's no future, just stay in the moment. And if you can concentrate on the moment, you just tend to feel better about things because this is what you're experiencing is the moment. Well, yeah, I mean, it's like, uh, that's is also, you know, the theory of living in the now because if you're constantly living in, in what you want to be the future, you're going to pass up the journey because the journey is where it's all at. There is nothing more than the journey of what you're on now. There's no destination. The destination doesn't happen. I mean, you could have goals and stuff, but if you're, if you're never going to be satisfied because you have this goal that that's insurmountable that you can never reach, you're never going to enjoy the journey, which is where it's all at. Everything is the journey. I mean, for us musicians getting on stage and playing music and having a great time at that moment is what it is all about. You know, in those moments when you're with friends, uh, you know, on an island somewhere playing a concert, and then the next day you're in the coast of Spain, and the next day you're in Sweden, and the next you're in a fjord in Norway, and each one of those moments is amazing. You have to take that in because life is so short. You got to like grab every moment like that that you can and take it in and uh, and try to remember it because it's it only happens for a short period of time. I've been trying to think of things that way, you know, when, when, when they're so intense, I can think of the musicians and friends that are not with us anymore, you know, that, uh, wow, I really don't have problems. You know what I mean? You really got to sit back, relax and think to yourself, man, it's amazing. We're here in the first place. I'm just going to relax. Maybe I'll have a glass of wine, you know, (laughs) that's it. And that's, and I think there's some truth to being in the moment. I mean, like you said, it's very difficult to think about it constantly, but if you can just tap into it a little bit and just go if you get a little bit anxious or you get a bit depressed or whatever just refer to where i where you are at the moment and tap into the moment and if you can do that it helps a great deal yeah 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 that's a great theory that's a great theory awesome man so i didn't waste my money going to the zen master bill (laughs) hey that's right (laughs) there was some there there was some purpose in looking at that wall you know, looking at a wall, yeah. meditating with your eyes open. There was some purpose to That's that. Right. Yeah, live in the now. Live in Zen. the now. Yeah, that's right. Or, that's... or there's also a phrase that I always use: that that cannot go on forever will eventually stop. You know, so anything you think of that you're doing or th- that you're going to do, if it can't go on forever, at some point it will stop. Yeah. Interesting, right? I always thought of that. But living in the now. Yeah, we're living in the now. That's right. And, um, yeah, so uh, it has been a uh, – it's quite an un- – like, it, this is all precedent. We're all experiencing different things. And, uh, I mean, you guys were a bit lucky because you were in um, autumn. No, spring. You were in yeah. spring. No, we are in, like, sept- uh, uh, September or October. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it, was, it wasn't hot, but it wasn't cold. You know, it was nice. It was actually pretty nice. But I'm talking about the covert in America because it was, it came in your springtime, whereas in Melbourne, we're going into the winter, which is traditionally really bad for flus and colds. So it's going to be interesting to see how that all takes shape, you know, because all of a sudden uh, the government have decided to open up things next week. So we're going to see what takes shape there. I'll be very interested, but definitely no clubs, no bars, no venues, no music. Oh, all the tours, all the festivals, everything in Europe, everything has been canceled. States, nothing is open. Nothing. There's over 30% unemployment in the States right now. 30%. I mean, it's since the great depression that was here, it's even worse than that. They expect the economy to be worse, unprecedented in the next several months. And, uh, it's all a first. It's all breaking new ground in, in an extremely bizarre situation. And they don't even know if there's going to be resurgence of this COVID in, uh, in the fall, which will, which will extend the, the, the non-working atmosphere for musicians. I mean, that's insane. I mean, literally, I have uh, me and Robin Ford, Daryl Jones, and Keith Carlock are supposed to go to Japan uh, in September, and I don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, me and Mike Stern have about 20 concerts in November in Europe. I don't know if that's going to happen. Everything else was canceled. Uh, I'm going to do a record actually in October, another new band of mine. I'm, I'm calling the Players Club with um, Jim Beard on keyboards, Tim LaFave on bass, and Keith Carlock on drums. 
it's going to be um, similar, I would say, to my Starfish in the Moon. Actually, I have it right here. Well, it's just, can you see this? I can say that. Yep. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> it was just cleaning places. It wasn't there for any reason except I was cleaning things out. I found it. <laughs> One of the rare copies. I'm, I'm putting together a new web website uh, that's going to have all of my CDs offered Incredible. for download. Every one of them, yeah. So I'm, I'm looking for them, see where they're at. <laughs> how, how? I mean, you, I've noticed in the early years you were really well dressed. Who used to do all your uh, costumes in that period of time? You mean like which years? In the uh, mid '80s. <laughs> well, that was like the fashion, the fashion '80s. So it was like you could tell that it was definitely the '80s. Uh, you know, you're playing with some hip bands, John McLaughlin, and Miles, and whatever. So you know. Might as well get some good press and wear, wear some good fancy clothes. <laughs> it was fun. It was fun. I mean, if I wore it now, it'd be like, you know, it, but look at that guy wearing some retro back to the 80s clothes. You know, the 80s were like yeah. big collars, baggy pants. Uh, you had the white coat going on. Oh, yeah. Oh, I had all that, man. You yeah. should have seen my closet. It was crazy. It was like a rock and roll singer's closet. <laughs> Miles got me into that. I went through like a fit. <laughs> Did he force that upon you? Did he say, no, look, you're no, going to no. play in my band, you have to dress a certain way? No, or? no, never. You can do whatever you want. But, you know, if you're going to stand up there with him and he's going to have some really cool classic clothes on, you can't wear a pair of jeans and a T-shirt and make and play in that band, you know, especially since everybody was looking at that band. So Marcus Miller was playing bass. Yeah, it was intense. It was cool. It's a long time ago, but a lot of it fun. It is. A lot of fun. So when you went to Nashville early this year, what – What's the recording? What, did, you, did you do it in a uh, recording studio, or was it at a home studio? Or no, no, no. It was um, a, a studio called Southern Ground, which is um, Zach Brown has a studio there, and that's it. No, it's a big, beautiful, classic studio that a lot of the Nashville country hits were recorded there. Um, you could see all the gold records on the walls. Yeah, it's a classic studio like Johnny Cash, Elvis Presley, uh, all those guys had recorded there. And, it was cool to play there, you know, and, uh, and get a chance to play some music. Robin wrote some really great tunes. I wrote some tunes. And what's also interesting, there's a tune I wrote with Clifford Carter, a keyboard player, a friend of mine. Um, a singer in Germany named Max Mutzke, Mutzker is probably the most well-known rock singer in Germany, and he's phenomenal. And I wrote a tune that he sang on uh, as a guest on the record. Phenomenal. I can't wait till that record comes out. And did you do that live with the whole band, or was yeah it the only done yeah it Max overdubs? Max overdubbed his solo uh, uh, vocal part because he was in Germany and we're in Nashville, but yeah the whole record was done live yeah fantastic yeah. so is the engineer in the same room with you guys or he's yeah well you know in the control sort of room booth. and then we have a couple ISO booths we could all see each other and you know since it's Pro Tools we just they just leave it running we just start go you know. It came out really well. Matter of fact, I did have a, co a copy of it somewhere. I'm looking forward to hearing it. Yeah, matter of fact, I just got, <laughs> we just have a pre, a record uh, that we're going to put out, we're going to just release in Japan. This is it. But it's called Common Ground. And um, yeah, it's really cool. It's Rob and me and Daryl. And, that's what, and that's what we are. It's, it's, uh, we're all on Common Ground. That's it, man. And that's, just, and that's actually the, the title track, and it's actually the song that Max Mutzke had um, sang on too. Yeah. Phenomenal, man! It's a it's a really hip track. I dig it. Thanks for having me on your show, man. We shall be in touch. Yes, that's it. Thank you for your time again, Bill. Right, I appreciate you, it. Oh, no problem, Pete. Keep in touch. I will. All right, man. I'll see you. Only one place left to flee when voodoo strikes. It'll tear apart your head when voodoo strikes. You was dead when voodoo strikes It'll tear apart your head